Calling All Explorers is a podcast from the Harvard Innovation Laboratory in Boston. Your hosts are Harvard Business School alumnus Ronald Terrazas and me, Harvard junior Jessica Pizzolides. Along with Dr. Gordon Chu, we are co-founders of iLab member Fingra, a for-profit public benefit corporation dedicated to discovery, development and commercialization of materials that can transform humanity's ideas of sustainability and ecology. Dr. Chu is our regular guest. He is a globally recognized scientist who is author or co-author of 41 international patents, many dealing with the wonder material graphene. He is a distinguished alumnus of Harvard Business Analytics Program and of Wharton's Advanced Management Program. Hi, Dr. Chu. Hi, Jesse. Thank you for joining us again for another podcast. Um, Today, we'll be continuing our conversation about the acronym MILES. We'll be looking at the L-E-S. So would you like to begin by, um, yeah, telling us a little bit about um, what this acronym means and um, what the latter half of it in particular is? Yeah, um, with the latter half, you know, we spent two little amount of time the amount of time we spent was not enough um on m and i previously um but that's okay because we only have so much time and so i'm going to interlace time as a um as a particular denominator into all equations so as the audience is listening i want them to think about this and you know because you do mention fingra so many people have reached out uh, since our first two um, podcasts, saying, "Can you um, can you get right to Fingra? Uh, can you get right to it?" And and I my answer is really, it's actually necessary to understand the thinking because this is not my first startup. I've done over ten of them. Um, I don't count how many, and and I've done many, many. And what you learn is you never do them the same way again. And each time you improve dramatically on the target and what it is. So. Miles, the original acronym certainly works like M for money and, you know, that kind of approach that we talked about last time works. But now if you change your awareness and you make it meaning, right? And L, they in the book, they, they talk about um, location and luck as mm-hmm. the unfair advantage. Uh, really hard to argue against, Um um, but I would have to say I would definitely add in looks if you're going to say location and luck because someone who looks pretty or looks majestic or looks confident, certainly there's a lot of psychology around that giving someone an unfair advantage. Mm-hmm. Would you and would you, would you necessarily kind of <laughs> categorize it as unfair when so much of one's presentation is kind of within their control, how they choose to show up every day and um why why would you classify looks kind of up there with location and luck um well i i i i mean i i see that you look different um in your interviews uh previously i look different 20 years ago than i do now uh, many people say i look the same and that's that's <laughs> also an advantage right they say you have an age <laughs> right yeah yeah so so look is to the eye of the beholder so if you can align your look with those who are looking for what you look like, then certainly um, you could get um, uh, contact and or a point of reaction, right? Uh, same thing with a with a with a with a, uh, with a startup in technology that presents in a place that is anti-technology or not interested in that particular technology. It's hard to get them to look at you, right? So looks are deceiving. Same thing with location and luck. What's a great location can become not so good um, as the appetite or the mood changes or under different time periods. Detroit is like such an incredible location. Um, once upon a time in, 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 in 2023, it's not the, it's not the same, right? So, so location is a, um, is a, you know, it, 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 you mentioned diminishing returns that time um, on our last podcast. And I would say that location can be and luck. The issue with luck is who doesn't want to be lucky, right? There's a quote that says it's better to be lucky than to be good. Um, 
But the problem with luck is it's non-transferable. And, mm. um, and I brought up looks because looks are also non-transferable. What do you mean by non-transferable? To your next generation or someone you want to help. Oh, look, um, my wife looks like this. Is it transferable to you? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> how, yeah. how transferable is that? Or my friend, my best friend looks like this. Or they're located uh, in this uh, in this particular um, uh, place in the world, and and how does that matter to you? My grandfather achieved X Y Z um, in their location, and when I say location, then I added that denominator of time is because sometimes location can also be time, right? And it could be affected by time, um, and it's important to consider these three L's as yeah. not. I, I, I introduced look as to challenge location and lock, but mm -hmm. I don't like look either as an unfair advantage because it's not enough. Right. Absolutely. It's not enough. It's just simply to get our, our listeners thinking. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so in the exploration practice, I would have to emphasize that, um, that how you live the word live and how you love the word L love makes a huge difference in how you might set up your miles, right? Yes. But that's so far away that most people who hear this will say, oh yeah, of course, love. But then I want to bring in something that's more closer to heart is leadership. How you lead, if you lead as a tyrant or someone who makes teams compete against each other versus if you lead with, with love and you care about your team, you could get some very different things accomplished than leading with um, a, a strong arm. And, um, and, and if you think about education, same way, if you teach someone um, using uh, hoop jumping and they keep yeah. taking tests and certain things, then, then you develop a very different relationship with your student. Uh, you know, the mentor and the coach to the student. And I, and I want to introduce a picture. I mean, picture how Hitler, right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a, you know, can find all this throughout the internet and history is how he led. And I want you to think of something like how princess Diana led, how mother Teresa led. And then I want you to use a picture of uh, a, 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 a book that's called the once and future King which Disney did something like that around the sword and the stone. And if you picture Merlin uh, and the to be King Arthur when he was a boy, how did Merlin lead Arthur? Did he tell him, take these tests and pull Excalibur out of the, out of the stone or, or what did the author write about it where Merlin would have an embracing attitude of leadership, trying mm -hmm. to let Arthur become aware of all these possibilities. And then he's aware that he is, he's to be king. And that requires a very different awareness. So leadership, leading with love, right? That's important. And then teaching. When you think about teaching as an exercise versus teaching to launch the next leadership, the yes. next group, right? So launching, another word, L, launch leadership with love, leadership with ser servitude, uh, launching, those are different L words, certainly very different than location and luck. Would mm -hmm. you say? I would, I would agree. Very different, but each with their yeah. own different flavor and I guess contribution to this um, yes. philosophy of possessing an exploration mindset. Um, right. Can you talk a bit more about launch though? Um, where does that yeah. tie in? Why does that follow so, on from leadership for you? So I love, you see, I love to use math um, and physics because everybody experiences it, but it's such a foreign subject matter, right? Um, yes. In fact, when you're, when you start off, you learn that Y equals X um, is, is it, you keep learning about Y equals X. In fact, you call it Y equals MX plus B, um, even though you're not French and, but you use the M for mountain and everyone, everyone talks about it. Um, and then you keep learning that and it's called algebra 
And then you might even learn some, uh, some of that. You use it again in trigonometry and uh, geometry. So you just spent, you actually spent like three years on this same thing yeah. on just Y equals X. And it's a very uninteresting um, formula because it makes 10 X very impressive because it, you know, on a linear level, right? You see, wow, 10 times. So venture capital oftentimes looks for 10 times the, the result but as an explorer, remember, you're not the venture capital, you're not the angel, you're the explorer. How do you change your launch, right? Well, change the equation. And if we use y equals x to the fifth power, if we just put two inside of x equals two, we get 32 versus if we put two inside x for uh, something that's linear, um, we get only two. So of course, 10 times is going to be very hard to do because some people can only get 0 0.5, x equals 0 0.5 or, zero, or, or one and a half or something like that, very fractional. But the impact when the setup is different, when the launch is different, when the launch is um, polynomial. Not linear, but exponential. Right? Yeah, yeah, what happens, right? So, so then we think about, you know, how do you do that? Right? Do, do we, first, you must want to do that. Before anything, you must know the value of doing that. And then if we looked at something called um, dy dx, right, um, uh, taking a derivative of it, right, when we take a derivative of the, of, the, of the formula, then we know the rate of change. We can see, and if you look at y equals x, it doesn't change. In fact, you take the derivative dy dx, it's one. So it's constant and a constant Monster. monomial formula, right? shows yeah. you that that's all you're going to get and if you do a second derivative of that you get nothing right so 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 but if we did y equals x to the fifth and we did dy dx to it we would then get right five x to the fourth right using the power rule right which we we name it the power rule but we we then we then that just allows people to have a name to it but the 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 point is that it's still exponential even after the first derivative and the second derivative it's mm -hmm. still going to be exponential, even though now it's the third power, right? You still get that exponentiality because we, 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 we realize we have to do X. Yeah, we, we, it didn't get eliminated by doing two derivatives. And the last time we talked about low tall and all, but, but the point is it is that the, if you use math as a filter and physics as a filter, then suddenly we can, view, uh, because science is quite objective, we can view things of what we're trying to say um, and express it differently. But now I'm going to switch on you, all right? I'm going to switch to Elton John. <laughs> and Elton John, right, he used two words that I love also much more than, um, than, than location and luck, all right? And what he did in his first phrase in the song in, in Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Are you familiar with this song? Have you heard it before? Yes, I have. All right, so there's two L words I want the listeners to think about, right? And it's, um, when are you gonna come down? Oh, when are you going to land? I should have stayed on the farm. I should have listened to my old man. So you hear the two L words and it's land and listen. Yes. And imagine, right, we talked about launch, but if you use the word land, land is the result of the post the launch, right? So post launch, you land. What if you landed on the wrong spot? What if you landed on, um, not on the rainbow that you're supposed to land on, uh, the end of the rainbow and you landed somewhere else? What if you landed on happily unhappily ever after, um, what happens then? One life to live, improper landing, crash landing. So don't we need to practice landing and practice launching? That's where an exploratory mindset is very, very important. And last time we talked about being silly too, which is the S word we will get to on the LES. But LES as a syllable, less, right? Miles, you don't really say that syllable. But lesson, uh, the lesson, if you look at LES, the lesson around if you become aware. And here's another example of doing something. And you could do it using uh, Goodbye, Elbrick Road, is look at his first paragraph, his first phrase. And while you're reading the lines, 
try to look peripherally around other things that are around you, right? So if you increase your peripheral awareness on reading a book, a phrase, various things, and as you as you let the other senses come in, mm -hmm. you broaden your field of vision, right? It's the opposite of being laserly, another L word, focused, laserly focused. People said you need to focus, but the laser, while it's so good, to Might be laserly to focused. Everything else around. Well, a light bulb, the other L word, lights your path. It lights the whole room. There's a certain illumination, luminary. You know, if you if you come up with something as an explorer, you are a luminary by default. Mm -hmm. But laserly focused on the wrong spot. So the launch and the landing and the proper landing are very important. So I look at it in my miles is I'm always concerned about the delta, the difference, the, uh, the uh, you know, whether it's just, I don't want to just do a lot of distance. I want to look at displacement. I want to also consider, am I landing in the right spot? So my M-I-L-E-S as an explorer has to be because you are, as an explorer, like I know everybody wants to hear about Fingra and why this is, why, why, how can you do so many startups and still keep going? Well, you don't ask that about songwriters, right? In fact, you want them to come up with more pieces, right? People always say, what are you going to work on next? And it is always to never peak. Don't peak because if you peak, the other side of the peaking is downhill, Right. So, <laughs> so, so it, right. Yeah. Year. That's what made, that's why I picked Goodbye Yellow Brick Road as a song for us to discuss the, the L word because, mm -hmm. you know, most songs don't go into what Elton John did in this one. It talks about Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. So, the Yellow Brick Road in Wizard of Oz, right? You're going there because it's so important, but to say goodbye to it, isn't that such incredible contrast? Mm. And I yeah. think a lot of what, you know, we've just been speaking about now, everything kind of comes in these contrasting pairs, whether it's launching, which is such a kind of active, um, you know, notion versus landing, which feels much more kind of passive or, you know, luck versus, you know, kind of, you know, pursuing things in a much more kind of aggressive and passive and, you know, agent oriented way. Um, and I think, you know, success just has this paradox where it's, you know, where, luck and preparation meet right um and as a result like you know to be an explorer you know you do have to you know almost put your hands up slightly to kind of you know have that hope that something falls but also be as absolutely prepared as possible so that when that you know lucky moment does arise that you do discover something or that you know an amazing opportunity does come up that you're ready to grab it um and so I think it's interesting that you brought up this contrast with you know, within Elton John's own lyrics. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I um, uh, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about our, our podcasts. Um, that would make it more work than it should be, right? It wouldn't be natural either, right? But what I do is I think about what people need to hear, right? What would they want to hear in their startup? Because it it's not my startup, right? Because mine doesn't really matter to them, but their own journey, right? And I asked the question of, because you're, you are you have learned math and you kept going with it, that, you know, one of the really peculiar things about IB is that they actually introduced the principle of, of putting all the math in one book. Mm. As an American, right? As an American AP student, right? Well, you know, oh, we're going back, you know, decades, right? <laughs> is that you? You you don't you don't have it all in one book. But because I taught IB, I got a chance to see this, and I said, "What a very different way of doing this." Because because you know, if you wanted to know the minimum or maximum of a quadratic equation, if you knew only algebra, you would then have to use. Um, minus b over a 2a right minus b over 2a and you have to memorize that constantly memorize that but once you experience calculus you just take the derivative of the function first derivative and then you find you set it to zero because there's no slope change and then you find this and you say but those are totally different languages uh, one is absolutely. memorize right <laughs> right right mm -hmm. yeah and i i encourage you to 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 comment about this because you're much closer to when that inflection happened in your life 
versus me where I, I'm like three decades for, de you know, three decades out at least. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think, I think it's, it's an interesting comment. Cause I, you know, I went through, you know, the British education system. I did my GCSEs and then I did the international baccalaureate. So maths was always yeah. one subject. It wasn't like in the U S where I, you know, I presume you take, you know, you know, algebra and then geometry and all these different kinds of branches of maths. But now that I'm studying it at undergrad, um, it's all very yeah. separate. Um, you know, you right. take an analysis class, a geometry class, um, you take algebra. And I think, you know, as a result, it's in terms of how it's impacted kind of my mindset, I find it so exciting to see these kind of common themes in maths pop mm -hmm. up in so many different classes because they're such refined toolkits. Um whether mm -hmm. you're looking at abstract algebra versus linear algebra versus real analysis, complex analysis, you know, differential geometry, classical geometry, whatever it might be, it's, you know, a similar kind of mental game of, you know, using what you know to solve what you do not know, um, particularly in the kind of proof construction concept or, or process rather. Um, right. And I think, you know, for me having all of these, courses separated out has actually really kind of complemented that I feel like I've become a much more kind of rigorous mathematician not a mathematician but you know math student um because I've been able to kind of categorize these skills where they should be rather than just it being one big lump of maths that I you know assume that you know calculus and algebra are there you know kind of a combined entity when really they're their own you know own ballparks altogether so so that I'm going to ask my, you. My I'm going to ask you another very blissful time. The most blissful time I think in one's life is high school, right? So when in your in your time period, because there there's an inflection point of where you get to land in in university, right? And um yeah. and your launch. Did you begin launching for uh, for let's say Harvard University? That's your launch, right? And you want to yeah. land there. Do you did you start preparing for that? Um, at, at, you know, at when you were uh, at 11th grade or, or 10th grade, or did you start preparing that when you were two years old? Um, when did you start launching is, is a very interesting thing, because should you be aiming and end gaining? And I'm going to use E because we're going to enter the E word end gaining. If I don't get into Harvard University, I'm going to die. Right. Or if I don't get into Harvard University, that's my my goal, my dream. I have to be there. And what happens when we all want the same thing, but it's that's it might not be good for us, right? It mm -hmm. may not be right for us. And so living, to finish off the L, living what is right for us, right? Mm -hmm. For us individually is very important. And to discover that um, as an entrepreneur, yeah. explorer mindset is really important because innovation if you don't have innovation and you're an entrepreneur, you you might not go very far. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, right. And we were talking about that kind of stuff. So Harvard University, when did you start preparing for that? It was absolutely <laughs> not at the age of two. For me, it was, I was always just, I always knew I wanted to do something cool. And I always knew I wanted to do well in life. And it's a, it's a perennial goal. Um, but I, I started kind of preparing pretty late. I'm not going to lie. I think, you know, I really wanted to um, go to a really good school, but, um, you know, none of, this was totally unprecedented. No one in my family had, you know, really been in the U.S. at all. Um, for me, it was mm. just much more, you know, I knew I wanted to go to a good school. So around, you know, 12th grade, you know, I had, I realized I had all the tools, you know, I just been an explorer my whole life. You know, I'd loved maths a lot. I'd loved literature. I had a charity. I just did a lot of things for the sake of doing them because I loved them, not because I was end gaming um, to go ah, back to the E. I didn't. So you were start... not end gaming. You didn't start at two. You didn't, no, you know, that's I think I think there. that's really detrimental to any <laughs> right. sort of sense of ah. innovation. I think you have to find kind of an intrinsic drive to learn for the sake of learning and create for so the sake now, of creating. Now I'm going to make it really interesting, right? Because a high school is one of those best times in the world. And then a, a gentleman falls in love with you, Jesse, and says, I want your hand in marriage. I know I have to have you, Jesse. And you look <laughs> at him, right? Oh, you know, don't look at him yet. All right. But, but you see, right, this becomes like, what do you do, right? If you're Harvard University and someone comes to you, right, uh, and says, I have to have you, 
my life will end without you. I just know that you're the right place for me, right? See the why I brought this type of contrast is because when we end game, look what happens on the dates or on things. And, and if this was some island where, you know, we have to use a lizard mentality and this is all we're going to do, we're all animals, then, then yeah, it would be, it could be animalistic, but then if we're, if we want to bring out our humanity, our creativity, our innovation and gaining is actually quite detrimental. Uh, I, yeah. I agree. And I think, I think there's also like, you know, a very healthy balance between, you know, having an attainable goal. I think that if you want to get anywhere, you know, whether it's, you know, you want to lose weight, you want to get a good mm. job, you want to, you know, be a better friend, you know, having like very attainable goals and ends is crucial. But at the same time, making sure that those motivations are equally, you know, fulfilling yes. and in line with that kind of greater goal is very important. Um, I didn't well, I create Mentor Junior. Right? I created that. I, I started it when I was <laughs> like almost 14, 15. I had no idea that I wanted to go to a school that cared, you know, in the UK, the college, mm. colleges don't, they only care about grades. I created that because I loved it. Um, I played hockey because I loved it. I mm -hmm. led maths clubs because I, I didn't do any of this with any angle, but they were all, you know, intrinsically valuable to me. And I think that there's something potentially dangerous with, you know, completely shadowing the concept of end gaming. Um, Cause I think nihilism is a really, you know, it's a really, really dangerous <laughs> thing to humanity right. to be quite frank, but you know, there's yeah. a, there's a, there's a healthy balance as with anything. As with anything, right? So I, I don't disregard the uh, unfair advantage, you know, the, the M-I-L-E-S, but from an entrepreneur that, that knows they need exploration or from a corporate explorer you know, corporations that know they need to explore, once you realize that, the realization also comes with end gaming prevents you from discovering things because you're looking for the blue book. And because it's the blue book, anything else that's not blue, you get rid of because it has to be the blue book. And so imagine if you, you know, I was going to look for something for you and you tell me, I said, what, what does it look like? He said, it's a blue and it's a book, right? Well, what happens if it's a red scroll? Oh, that can't be the red scroll. <laughs> it has to be the blue book. So so we, when we end game and we, we too, put too much on there, so but they, but Miles in the unfair advantage book, they don't use E for end game. They use they use E for education and expertise is what will give you an unfair advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and and I say, well, the quality of education goes beyond what school you attend or the brand, uh, and the expertise goes beyond selling your expertise. As an explorer you should be motivated by a different E. You could say it's explorer, but the different, the E would be expansionist, right? Mm -hmm. So an education that's related to expansion uh, rather than a restrictive type of education mindset brings you to the ability to reach higher potentials, right? Absolutely. Higher potential. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a word problem, right, that, that allows people to think about this, is that we go into a store, Mm -hmm. And there's a, for a three bottles of water and two uh, apples, right? Three bags of uh, three bottles of water, two, two apples will cost us $7. And if we reverse the numbers, and so we say two, uh, uh, two waters and three apples will cost us $8. And we, if we apply substitution to solve for the question of how much will two apples or two waters and two apples just in the same sequence, how much will it cost? And if you use substitution, it would take you a bit of time, but eventually you would get there. And if you use elimination, it would take you a bit of time, but you get there, but you would do it as a process. Now, if we think peripherally about something um, and also while we're reading something, we will see the things around us. What happens? We're defocusing, but we're absorbing and we're, we're aware of these things. So what happens to us then? Well, Jesse, how come we can't buy everything in that store? So we bought everything in that store or in that word problem. We would buy, we would we spent $7 and $8. So basically we would spend $15. We'd have the three bottles of water and the two bottles of water in those two situations. And then the other one, it would be, uh, the three bags of chips and the two bags of chips, we would end up having five and five of each and we would have spent $15. Then we know 
that the water and the chips or the water and the apple, right, as an example, gives you the uh, one of each would be $3. So two of each would be $6. That is not substitution and it's not elimination, but it is an expansionist mindset, which um, is my E that I re highly recommend for mm. um, to add on. So instead of education, leave that as is, is education with the expansion mindset, expertise with the expansion mindset. So now we're looking at, okay, if we apply that to the water bear that we mentioned, all right, what would, like, why did those, that micro animal survive in Mars and other places? Uh, it's an animal. So humans are animals. Could human beings model around that and create the possibility? Very interesting. Very um, it's a, requires right? an expansionist mindset. <laughs> right. So, but if we used a restrictive mindset, well, the earth is going to end. That's why we have to work on the um, the water bear, right? The tardigrade. The tardigrade. Uh, we have to work on it because of that. Um, that drives us very differently. Versus, if I learn about this, I might find certain answers to unlocking the secrets of the universe. Yeah. Mm, right. Driven by a completely different goal. Um, but expansionary, so you're not end gaining either. It, it's, you only even want to set the goal because that might not be what comes out of it, mm. right? And that that is very different thinking. Kind of like if someone were to uh, compete in the Olympics. Have you done that before? I have not competed in the Olympics. <laughs> right. So if I, you I in study the Olympics, maths. I'm like <laughs> right, 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 right. But uh, there's the math Olympiads though. But you know, if you oh, okay. Yeah. Right, but if you competed in the actual Olympics, the the, you know, the 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 world, the one that everyone watches, that Olympics, um, or if you you were preparing for that, the high school that you go to, and I want to highlight the education restrictive uh, issues of that, is that it might not be compatible with um, professionally being either a singer songwriter or professionally being an actor and actress or professionally being in, in, in the Olympics. And so is it compatible with innovation and um, ex having that explore mindset? No, absolutely. And I think there, there's so much to be said about how, you know, mm. certain education systems are structured to kind of foster this, you know, incredibly exam focused sort of education. You know, I am very, you know, pro kind of testing. I think, you know, like it, it's, you, you know, like having kind of a standardized way to kind of, you know, measure one success, but at the same time, you know, like learning for an exam is, you know, infinitely different to kind of learning for the sake of it. Um, right. And feeling open and able to just, you know, keep on double clicking on concepts that you find confusing and fascinating rather than learning the mark scheme. Um, and, and in that sense, you know, I, it's, it, it begs the question of, you know, are, you know, are GCSEs in the UK the best way to approach that? Um, or is, you know, kind of a more internet, like a baccalaureate model, slightly more, you know, close to this exploration where one has to, you know, do their own kind of, you know, research paper in every subject that they take. Um, but mm. yeah, education requires reform. Absolutely. We, we know that something is, uh, is lost, right? In, in the in the trajectory because a lot of people come out saying um you know that that what you learned you don't even use um but is it the fault of only the education or the content or is it the fault of the individual not having the awareness what exactly is it and how much is this needed how much do we need innovation uh, you know and and you then start to see Wow, if it was so, ideas, people say, are a dime a dozen. But the innovate, to innovate and to have something actually work is extremely valuable. So how can it be so contrasting? How could ideas be worth so little, but innovation um, to be so crazily important that companies will be paying left and right over it? And that 
that, you know, when we get to the S word, we won't be able to finish the S word because I look at the time, it's 34 minutes in. So I guess this podcast would just have to be longer, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another L word. But, the, but when I get to the S word, I am going to give you something that is um, so mind-blowing that it will change for those who listen to that uh, and finish the M-I-L-E-S. They will, they will change how they view everything in life it will be so transformative. Now, the reason why our discussion has to be so transformative is because you only get roughly, other than this outlier, 20 minutes or so every two weeks, right? And you need practice because the rest of your life, the rest of the, um, all the other 24 hours, you only have 20 minutes uh, in, on this one or uh, 30 minutes or so, but the rest of your time is not, on an expansionist mindset. You're looking at everything from a restrictive is how do I get this in order to get to that person? Look at LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn, so many people try to add each other so that they can have each other's contacts. Now you have everyone's contacts, but do you really talk with them? Mm. All right. If someone's not linking you, this is just a, you know, a term I, I make up is if they're not linking me, we're links, but they're not linking me. So they just send a message over. Um, and um, we don't normally talk, but they ask me about something um, that they need. Obviously, they need something, so they send it over. What is the likelihood of you not responding favorably when they don't talk to you about anything else? Okay. All right? right. So what's the what what is the point of the linking? All right, the LinkedIn. If you're not linking within LinkedIn, and then um, and then somebody who gets a lot of links. Right? a lot of linkings from people daily, and then you send over a linking message. Well, and, and it's not blinking when it's linking, right? You send a message, it gets buried over it, and you get shuffled down. So if you're one of 500 messages coming in daily, um, you could be lost. You might have to send a few other linking messages to get the person, but now you're a harasser. <laughs> because I mean, right? Because so so it comes the, the setup of a system runs into all kinds of points of failure when we don't really think about the exploratory mindset is is, is extremely rare to um and to get to that requires practice. You Absolutely. have to practice with a group, right? A group of individuals. Do you have a lot of time at Harvard to practice this expansionist, um, you know, uh, community mindset, like what we talk about in calling all explorers? We haven't gotten to graphene yet, but you know, how do you how do you do that at Harvard? Um, it's through the people. I know it's the most cliche answer, but I think the greatest mm. gift that this school has, you know, given mm. me is the opportunity to, to be surrounded, no matter where I go, no matter if I'm in mm. the dining hall and office hours. You know, going on a run, I'm surrounded by people that do have this mindset and that mm -hmm. do want to, you know, be here and study what they're studying, whether it's, you know, romance literature or, you know, planetary science or, you know, complex analysis, whatever it might be. You know, they're learning it for the sake of it, um, not for oh, any kind there of you go. ulterior. Right. And that's how I believe. They weren't preparing when they were two years old, right? Yes. So you you have discovered the answer to why calling all explorers uh, shares about this philosophical um, need to drive innovation is to be around people who, who just innovate. They just do it all day long. And that is the, unfortunately, when you have institutions, then, then, and everybody wanting, you know, the brand becomes very loud. Then everyone says, Oh, if I go there, my life will change. And actually it's the other way around. If you change your life, you will get there. Mm -hmm. right? No, it's absolutely. The, yeah. And I think I think on that <laughs> right. note, maybe yeah. we'll we'll round it off. And and I look forward to hearing about what the S is to conclude our discussion on M I L E S. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you so much, Dr. Chu. Thank you for listening to another episode of Calling All Explorers. To find out more, please visit fingra.com. That is P-H-E-N-E-G-R-A dot com. Thank you.